Hello, welcome back. Mark Risen Hopkins here at South by Southwest 2011, and I'm here with Nick Dukoff from InfoChimps, where uh, I'm fam I'm pretty familiar with because oh, I'm a I'm a Texan and I, I hear about these guys all the time. You may or may not. You should, probably should know who these people are, but if you're not. Nick, I was just going to have you start off uh, with a little bit of an elevator pitch. Talk about what your company does and uh, acquaint them. I hope, hopefully, they can hear you over the uh, whatever that is—a keynote or contest, whatever's going on out there. So. Sure. Thank you. InfoChimps is a marketplace to find, share, and build on data. We have two big customer bases. One is the developer community, which we're just really focused on making it super easy for developers to build applications. Um, you know, an application is really two things, right? It's code and it's a database. And uh, there's lots of folks out there that help developers get access to code, such as GitHub, but there's really not a centralized repository for structured information, data. And so that's what we're building. And, um, we're really excited about it. The other part of our business is our marketplace where we have data sets that are published and can be downloaded as flat files. So if you're, you know, mom and pop or, you know, non-technical user and, you know, data for you is, you know, viewable in Microsoft Excel, that's, you know, that's the place for you. The beautiful thing is it's all found at the same place and that's infochimps.com. So uh, I was gonna I was gonna talk a little bit about uh, your recent announcement. M Michelle, a uh, former contributor to SiliconANGLE, uh, if you're watching this video, you probably know who Michelle Greer is, has been excitedly talking in hushed tones. Don't tell anybody till we announce, but check a look at this. It's really cool. Your API Explorer and the launch of is it 1,000 APIs, 1,000, 2,000 data sets. So uh, I, I've. I've never really uh, dug as deep into your data sets as I have in the last couple of weeks while you've been turning on the API Explorer and, and uploading these new things. So uh, tell, me, tell me first of all about uh, the broadly about the data sets uh, and the API Explorer and how all that works and then we'll, we'll dive deeper into a, a couple of these that are really cool. Thanks, and you know, sorry to steal Michelle from you, but she's a rock star and, 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 and we love her. Um, so we recently published 2,000 new API calls, and um, you know that that's pretty exciting for us. Um, we're trying to make you know as much data as available um, in one place as as there is on the internet. And uh, these 2,000 API calls range from social media data to weather data to stock data. And uh, really, you know, our, our our key focus here was just to try to think of what are the building blocks for an application, and how can we provide just data sets that uh, you know, can inspire developers to build applications without ever having to bring data down onto their own server. Um, the, the API Explorer makes it super easy for anybody to come and see you know, after they pass through an input what, what the output looks like within their web browser. So they don't have to go and start coding to figure out what the output's going to look like. They can you know, get a few samples right there in the browser. So um, the uh and, and as, as someone who uh, is a lightweight developer these days, but uh, was a heavy coder back in my early days, uh, the API Explorer is what really makes it real, in my opinion. I mean, because you can, you can look at the documentation all day long, and, and uh, we, we spoke to uh, somebody earlier today that's in the documentation business, and as soon as you hear that, you know, it's just a snore, right? You know, you, I don't want to... Some it's either you're thinking about it. As somebody has to write the documentation, which is a which is a big task always, or someone that's got to read it. Unless you need it like five minutes ago, you you're not going to be hitting the books. Yeah. So, uh, but being able to just see a little box and like, okay, here's what I put into this box, and hit the button and see what comes out the other end. That's what makes it real. So that that's I think something that makes uh, what you guys are doing pretty exciting now. But uh, one of the ones that uh, Michelle showed me. Uh, was Queerly, uh, which is a, another company that uses you as the platform to uh, publish the data and the API. And so talk a little bit about what Queerly does. I, I can see a, a hundred uses for this, uh, for, for applications we're developing. So talk a little bit about what that does and, uh, and, and in depth about, uh, as much depth as you can about how they get their data and all that. Sure. Uh, so Queerly is a company run by Max Niederhofer based in London, UK. And um, he was uh, previously at Atlas Ventures. He was a VC, you know, came back to the bright side of things and uh, started his own company. What Quirly does is a database across social identities. So, you know, who are you online? Who am I online? I'm Nick Dukoff on Twitter. I'm slash Dukoff on Facebook. I'm slash Nick dash Dukoff on LinkedIn. And, you know, it's hard to sometimes find in a programmatic fashion, um, you know, all of the identities for a person online. 
And so what Quirly's done is you can pass through whatever you've got, um, Twitter handle or Facebook account or LinkedIn account, and it will help map across all of the other social networks and help you find your Flickr account, the YouTube account, you know, your LinkedIn account, um, so that um, you know developers can help build you know any number of applications. Yeah. Well, see, it, we we deal. We, we're based out of the Cloudera office. Our Palo Alto group is based out of the Cloudera office. So, uh, a lot of what we do is using Hadoop to bring structure into unstructured data and. Uh, I, I, that API right there, I think, saved us probably about three months worth of development on one aspect. Awesome. So we're gonna be using it, uh, just just so you know. Good. But uh, uh, I mean, being able to surface uh, surface content in, in a way that, uh, like, being able to access, you know, you know the people that are around it. Like an event by South, South by Southwest, you can troll feeds, find people that are there at South by Southwest, but you don't always have access to all the content they're publishing because they may not have an auto feed going. But, you know, with something like Queerly, you can pull all their other feeds and then, you know, just just filter it based on location or, or date range or whatever it is you're doing and uh, really come up with something useful. Um, you know, to speak a little bit about what they do, and I'm happy to also introduce you to Max. He, he's coming into Austin for South by Southwest, um, but I hope you get it through us and, and, not, and, not, and not them. But um, So what Max does is, you know, they use indicators, you know, strong links across your various profiles to see, okay, is at Nick Dukoff really the same guy as Facebook slash Nick Dukoff, right? You know, am I linking to my Facebook profile from my Twitter profile? Or, you know, in my Facebook, have I mentioned, you know, back to my Twitter profile or my About Me profile or, or something else, right? So that they can see, okay, well, is this person really this this person? Well, and then this kind of links into the uh, the other disc the other API we were discussing earlier, which is the Twitter profile search. That combined with maybe the Quirly search would be a great way of surfacing uh, like authority nodes uh, on you know uh, amongst content providers. So, talk about the differences between Twitter's native profile search. Uh, we did we ran it on Batman, uh, Batman Comics, my thing, and uh, versus the, the 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 profile search that you guys have. Sure. So we're really moving to having, um, you know, the data store of choice for us is Elasticsearch. It's an incredibly powerful tool that allows you to do uh, essentially Boolean searches across large data files. Um, for instance, the Twitter profile search is a hun across 100 million nodes. Um, and what we've got now is the ability to search across those 100 million users, um, you know, with the keywords that they use in their profile. And that can be, you know, obviously name, it can be uh, how they describe themselves, what they like, where even they're from. Um, Twitter, the way that they do it, uh, based on just the couple searches that we ran, it looks like they have some kind of um, method of looking both at the tweets themselves as well as uh, potentially other keywords around um, uh, what you type. In, in character Gotham news and all kinds of crazy stuff, nothing, none of it had to do with Batman comics per se, right. other than you know loosely associated with Batman. So. I guess if you're into that, yeah, there you go. Uh, but uh, if you want an exact match, this would be the way to go. So, um, so uh, it's not all social data. Uh, you've got, uh, I, I know there's some sports related ones in there. There's um, <clears throat> uh, raw uh, 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 word searches, uh, what was it, the British corpus, National right. Corpus. You've got uh, a couple other ones that escape me at the moment, just a, well, about 2,000 of them. But uh, <laughs> so, Lots of interesting data to be able to search. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, let's uh, le let's look a little bit broader. Uh, where did you guys? Where where was the inspiration for this? What was the aha moment? Because big data is this is the uh, is a focus for us editorially for the next foreseeable future, whatever that ends up being. <coughs> Because uh, we, we, we covered a couple of conferences recently, Strata, Hadoop, amazing viewership. Uh, we were just talking about the, the concepts behind big data, and it resonated with both our consumer-oriented audiences, developers, uh, of course, but also enterprise, because big data is something that affects them, too. And uh, it's not just all about social and mobile and you know the fun stuff that Mashable and the you know, TechCrunch and the Web2 blogs like to talk about, but it's, it's, it's crossed over to IT. So, <coughs> what, what was your aha moment that led you to pursue the path that, that InfoChimps has? Because you're, you're positioned at a good nexus for enterprise and all the consumer-facing 
data stores. So uh, just just talk a little bit about that journey. Sure. So Flip Cromer, another one of our co-founders and CTO, was pursuing his PhD in physics at UT. And in the course of his research, you know, spent a lot of time, you know, finding and munging data. Um, the, the kind of aha moment for him was it's a pain in the butt to find data online. You know, Google does a wonderful job of indexing, you know, blobs, unstructured information on web pages, but they don't do a great job of indexing structured information. And uh, so Flip set out to solve this problem and um, asked around uh, his, his fellow PhD candidates if anybody might be interested in pursuing, um, pursuing this uh, this this mission and found Drew Bansell who was also pursuing his PhD to come along join the InfoChimps team and kind of from there you know we've built up to 15 chimps uh, trying to democratize access to structured information. So, so talk about the process of uh, like data sanitization I know it's a mix of, of automated and uh, hand hand washing of, uh, of the data so talk, if you can uh, talk about that it may be part of your secret sauce but uh, if you can talk a little about that process I'd like to learn more. Sure. So one of our kind of core philosophies is we take data and we publish it in a structured format. We don't necessarily cleanse it. When there's clearly articulated demand for a very high quality data set, either we'll find it either through a third party supplier or we'll build it ourselves. Um, but it, unless there's clearly articulated demand, we publish it the same way that we find it. The only change that we make is we identify columns and rows so that you can, you know, in a machine readable format. Okay, but and also part of the role is, is documentation of that, which is which is your your next big. But you can only do with fifteen people do too, so much at one time. So you've got all the data published, and part of that role is actually making it searchable, curated, and, and findable. Yeah, so we absolutely want to continue to um, work on cleaning up the metadata, uh, you know, around the data. Um, one of the things that we've been working on is a, a unified format of metadata, um, and so that's something that we're pretty far along on and really. Excited about and I, I think it will really help um, with scalability because you know our data team can ingest data you know pretty quickly at this point you know we're pulling in you know hundreds of gigabytes a week or, or more um, probably closer to terabytes a week and um, but you know we got to make sure that we keep up with respect to you know documentation like you were saying and making it easily findable or we end up in the same place that we were before we started InfoChimps right um, and so what we've done is we've loaded all of the metadata into Elasticsearch as well as some of the data so that you know we obviously our search algorithm is part of our special sauce, but we try to make you know the data set that's most relevant to you adjacent uh, to the data that you either have or otherwise are looking for. So search search is really becoming uh, everything old is new again. That's like a, a, one of the themes: is people going back to search and reapplying it to problems that Google you know doesn't need to to work on. Right? Google is everybody thinks Google has solved search. And I think they'll probably be the first to tell you that we got 95% of it down. Uh, but I, I think it may be more than that, really, because there's so many different aspects of search that uh, haven't been tackled. I mean, you've got the semantic side. You've got uh, uh, different different organizations that are trying to patch holes in uh, micro site search, you know, or, or uh, whitelisted topic specific search. And, and you're you working on a couple different approaches to uh, structured data search. So. Uh, that's that's one of the things I'm seeing as emergent theme. What uh, just stepping back? I mean, you've been uh, I guess it's been like a day and a half here in South by Southwest, but you've probably been exposed to the the prep a little bit longer than I have, being local to Austin. What what are some of the themes you're seeing emerge out of the conference here? Sure. So you know, it's it's all about location, right? You know, I, you know, location, local, and you know the data that powers that. And so, with respect to location, you know, one of the important themes is, you know, places. Where am I standing right now? And there's a number of folks out there that, you know, t might even tell you different things about where you're standing. And um, so over the next couple months, we're pretty excited to announce some partnerships that, uh, you know, we'll save for another story um, uh, to really make it easy for developers to build location-based applications. And uh, obviously a big part of that will be, um, you know, retail inventory and, and, and other things about where you are, right? Happy hour specials. Um, you know, all the other ratings and reviews, you know, all the kinds of stuff that folks ask for all the time, you know, can you scrape City Search? can you scrape Yelp, and, um, you know, we won't necessarily, but we'll work with a lot of folks who have similar databases or those companies themselves to make it available to a, our developer community. So uh, one of the, yeah, so that, that's a good position to, to, to delve into a little bit because I think the, the fear is with uh, companies that sit in the position you do, 
uh, where you envelop so much of, of an ecosystem is that you will compete with that ecosystem eventually. We see it with Twitter, we see it with Facebook, uh, and you know those evangelists for those those organizations will will tell you, okay, we're not really competing, but we know they are. I mean. Either they are, or they're just really bad at communicating how they don't want to communi uh, compete with their uh, own ecosystem. So uh, that you uh, leave the data sanitization, scraping, and otherwise organizing to other people, and you're just organizing the organization right. of the data. That, right. that's, a, that's an interesting uh, point to elaborate on. Um, you know, for instance, um, a good number of those 2,000 data sets where we took factuals corpus of data sets and published them as APIs, right? So we took what was, you know, structured data and made it um, published in an application programming interface, right? And that was something that hadn't been done before. And now it's even easier to build on top of those databases, right? So, you know, they existed in the wild and we just made them easier to find and easier to access. And that's really what we're, what we're trying to do. Very cool stuff. Uh, big data, a theme, search a theme, South by Southwest 2011. I'm uh, Mark Rosen Hopkins. We've been chatting with InfoChimps, so uh, a company to watch. Uh, keep an eye on these guys. Play with the API Explorer. I can't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting paid by these guys to say this. I just really like it. I, I played with it and I really like it, so I think you should too. Uh, stay tuned to SiliconAngle.com. SiliconAngle.tv will have more coverage coming out of the conference, so don't go away.